Hey there, internet friends, and welcome to That D Plus Show. Class is in session for the only show from that nerdy site that lets you know what kind of quality to expect right from the name. I'm your host, Trevor Starkey, and each week we sit down with guests to talk about a Disney Plus offering of their choosing. The show is made possible entirely by the support of our patrons over at patreon.com slash that nerdy site. If you like the show, you can support us over there. We would, of course, definitely appreciate it. But if you can't, no big deal. The fact that you're listening is awesome, and of course, we would love it if you like, subscribe, rate, and review, and share with your friends. Uh, joining me today, we have nobody. I am flying solo for this episode. I uh, kind of want to test a potential format here of uh, can we do this as a one-person show? Um, should the need require? Should should the need arise if uh, basically everybody cancels on me last minute or something like that? If I can throw together an episode pretty quickly on my lonesome. Uh, so bear with me as we test this format out. And for this test pilot of this format-ish thing, yeah, well, whatever, uh, I'm going to be talking about Inhumans, the uh, very short-lived ABC TV show. Um, specifically, I've watched Behold the Inhumans and Those Who Would Destroy Us, which are the first two episodes of the series. I've started watching kind of uh, the the rest of the series as well, uh, but I have not gotten too much further into it, so uh, my most of my impressions will be kind of relegated to those couple of episodes. Uh, so why did I pick The Inhumans here? Uh, well, I picked it because I did want to test out this solo show format, um, and uh, as I was going through the list of Disney uh, Plus offerings, just kind of like looking at the massive A to Z list, I was looking through and I was like, uh, there's a lot of stuff here that I know people that that would want to talk about these kinds of things, um, so I don't want to really take up any of those options and kind of pull those off the table for the time being. Um, so I basically I was looking for something that I wouldn't feel bad selecting um, and removing from the queue for future guests. Um, and uh, also, I didn't watch this series originally when it aired, uh, uh, but you know the general consensus at the time way back in 2017 was that this was a very rough offering uh so uh i i was i i've kind of looked at it with a with an air of curiosity uh ever since and i just wasn't at the time i wasn't really watching much in the way of like weekly content um so much as playing video games or binging stuff so uh this is an opportunity for me to kind of dive into the the eight episode run of this show um and and see you know was it really as bad as everybody had said? So it seemed, with all those kinds of things in mind, it seemed like an interesting enough choice to try and uh, tackle here for a, uh, a solo show. So let's dive right into the history lesson. Uh, this was originally released, as I said, a September 29th through November 10th of 2017. Other notable releases at the time, you had um, The Orville, which is Seth MacFarlane's kind of take on a Star Trek type of show. Uh, that came out a couple weeks earlier on September 10th, 2017. You had the actual Star Trek show, Star Trek Discovery, came out uh, just a few days before this one on uh, September 24th, 2017. Uh, and that one has still been going on. We will circle back to it in a little bit with one of my little trivia notes. Uh, and then um, you had Young Sheldon coming out on September 25th, 2017, the prequel series to The Big Bang Theory show. And that thing that ran way, way too long and just made the easiest, easiest possible jokes at pop culture expense um, or nerd, nerddom and fandom and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that, I mean, that 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 is certainly a show. It's a show I'm glad is not on Disney Plus. Do not have to worry about trying to uh, to ever really tackle that. I've watched, you know, a good number of seasons of that show and it. I won't, I won't lie, it has its moments, um, but uh, it is also very, very bad at times, in my personal opinion. So, yay for them giving Sheldon a whole spinoff where you could have a young kid playing him and all of that. Uh, runtime for this series is uh, typically about an hour an episode. Uh, it is eight episodes long, was the uh, the first and only season. In the Disney timeline of things, I'm actually going to run through the Marvel timeline of things because this is the first of the Disney Plus offerings that we are doing that is not a directly Disney offering. 
um, i.e. like the Disney movies, the Disney animated movies, the Disney Channel original movies, or Disney Plus shows and all that stuff. So in the Marvel timeline of things, uh, this came out about a month after Marvel's The Defenders on Netflix. Uh, that had come out August 2017. Uh, And then it was a couple months before The Punisher would make its debut on Netflix, which came out in November 2017. And then uh, in terms of the kind of ABC side of things, which was Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agent Carter, and uh, and this show, uh, you had this basically coming out between seasons four and five of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, And I believe this came out, yeah, this came out after Agent Carter had already wrapped up. Um, That ended, I think, in 2016, I think is what I saw when I was doing the research. Uh, So, so yeah, that's kind of where this fell. Um, And it, it kind of hit and then petered out real quick. So in terms of who's who on this, the roll call for this episode, uh, we had the director of these two episodes, which kind of aired as a, um, a, a two-part, you know, season premiere, series premiere back in the day. Um, again, back in the day being 2017. Anyway, the director of those two episodes was uh, Roel Rene. Um, he, uh, in, in looking his IMDb, uh, a couple things that stood out to me were he directed Death Race 2 and Death Race Inferno, which were uh, seemingly direct-to-DVD sequels to uh, Death Race, which I think had, like, Jason Statham in it. Uh, and then he also did the direct to DVD sequel, the Scorpion King three battle for redemption. Uh, I was amazed that they were still making, uh, uh Scorpion King movies all these years later. Uh, and then he's also listed in pre-production as the director on a couple episodes of an upcoming halo TV series slated for 2021. So we'll see if, if that ever actually comes to pass, I guess. Um, yeah. In terms of the, writer and showrunner you had scott buck kind of heading this up uh he wrote these two episodes and then he was kind of the showrunner for the the rest of the eight episode run Uh, and he but prior to this had come from dexter Uh, he'd done that for a number of years and he was also the showrunner on marvel's iron fist on netflix so it was interesting kind of seeing somebody kind of jump from the netflix side of things to the abc side of things uh given that those notoriously did not really uh, align all that much uh starring i'm not going to run through kind of everybody in the core cast just kind of a few notable standouts because i looked through everybody and, and there just wasn't too much in the way of um kind of references that i could really draw on uh for a couple of these other people but uh you had you uh ewan ewan rion i don't know how his name is pronounced ewan rion anyway the guy who plays maximus uh, of course best known as ramsey bolton from game of thrones um, kind of coming in here and being a less sadistic bad guy this time around, but still more or less a bad guy. Uh, you have Anson Mount playing Black Bolt. Uh, a couple things that jumped out at me were that he was Britney Spears' love interest in the 2002 movie Crossroads. Uh, I remember, I'm sure, watching that. Probably didn't watch it in theaters, but I definitely remember watching it after the fact with, you know, friends at a, you know, hangout or party or something like that, just kind of making fun of the movie and how bad it was and all that stuff. Um, But the other thing that jumped out at me when I was looking up this guy's IMDb is that he would go on to play Captain Christopher Pike in Star Trek Discovery. Uh, Captain Christopher Pike is, of course, kind of the, um, the, the, he was the captain of the Enterprise before James Kirk took over back in the original series. So uh, it's kind of interesting to see him uh, uh, go from this role um, which aired, which debuted at like pretty much right the same time as Star Trek Discovery, and go on to uh, to play that more or less iconic role or co- iconic character at least in the mythos of uh, Star Trek. So uh, really cool to see that he's done that. I have not yet watched Star Trek Discovery myself. Heard great things. I got my dad season one for uh, for Christmas a couple years ago because he's a huge Star Trek fan. Um, has been uh, all his life and. Uh, and, and I like he was the one that kind of introduced me to the series and growing up and I've I'm sure I've seen every episode of the original uh, series multiple multiple times just because of you know how he would watch it and it'd be on in the background when I was growing up and all that stuff so um, but yeah Star Trek Discovery something I definitely need to check out just have not yet and it'll be interesting to see Anson Mount um, uh, in that in that role as well uh, and then uh, the last one I kind of pulled out here is Ken Leung 
uh, who plays Karnak in here. Uh, I, of course, recognized him from Lost. Uh, I want to say he was Miles was his character name in Lost. Uh, and then he was also one of the mutants in X-Men The Last Stand, kind of one of the more miscellaneous ones. I think he had, like, the, he was the one with spikes all over his face. Uh, and then he was one of J.J.'s friends that got cast in Star Wars The Force Awakens um, in the uh, kind of the, the battle scenes there on... Oh, it's not Yavin in that one. Whatever the the plant, like the the resistance's base of operations is, um, he's kind of one of the the engineers or captains or whatever there. Um, so it's cool seeing him pop up in this. Uh, some trivia for this show. Uh, of course, this was probably the most notable thing is that this was originally unveiled as a film is part of uh, the big kind of f- surprise phase three announcement. Um, uh, this was going to be in the film universe. Uh, probably, I don't know if it, it would have come out yet or not, because I think it was slated after um, Infinity War, or like Infinity Wars part one and two. I believe is kind of when it it fell in their timeline there. Uh, But of course that, you know, quickly got shifted around and scrapped um, in part, I'm sure because they started to like realize that introducing the Inhumans was maybe going to be a bit of a bigger haul. Uh, But then also you of course had the real big shakeup that caused uh, things in phase three to move around was the uh, Sony deal that brought Spider-Man into the universe. So Marvel kind of slotted a couple Spider-Man movies into phase three that had not originally been announced. So this kind of uh, took a back seat and, got retooled and and turned into the tv series here um and i think one of the big things that i that i saw is that um this was viewed very much as like the biggest gamble that marvel was going to have to do uh because you you know few people knew about guardians of the galaxy but they had a a, an interesting enough kind of hook um whereas the inhumans were going to be not only did people not know about the inhumans uh, a lot of people were going to immediately compare them against the x-men um and so the marvel cinematic universe kind of had to do a little bit more work to really set up who the inhumans were and and kind of their lore and backstory in here and so you had Another piece of trivia is that you had the Inhumans being introduced into the MCU via Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. uh, in uh, the second and third season arcs really kind of took a strong focus. You had Daisy kind of um, introduced or turned into or because it was she was Sky at first and then she kind of revealed herself to really be Daisy, uh, a.k.a. Quake, who is an Inhuman in, uh, in kind of the comics. So they kind of really used her as the you know, um, backdoor introduction into the Inhumans. Uh, you had a couple other characters in there uh, whose names at this point escape me. I want to say Lincoln and Reyna was the the bad person uh, and a couple others that, that have uh, evaded me. But that was very much kind of a big arc was um, the Terra Genesis, uh, all that stuff kind of got polluted the water supply or got into the water supply and, and got into like vitamin fish oil supplements or something like that so people were starting to go through terragenesis in mass in agents of shield and that helped introduce you know how these powered people existed in a world that didn't have the x-men um so that was kind of their way of really trying to set up the inhumans um they devoted a couple seasons of agents of shield to really focus on that Uh, Other trivia we have here is uh, Black Bolt in this series communicates via sign language. An idea was originally proposed to have a voiceover from Anson Mount as telepathy, uh, but the filmmakers ruled it out not only to make Black Bolt a little bit more enigmatic, but also to appeal to deaf and mute viewers. And I really like the choice of um, having Black Bolt use sign language in in this series. Um, I thought it was an interesting kind of um, approach. Uh, and seeing him kind of like use that to communicate with uh you know his people um i'm too early in to know if he kind of is able to use that to communicate with uh people um on earth and all that but um it also does highlight that if he would just write stuff down it would also it would be 
a lot of the like confusion that arises uh, and the tension that arises from that character not being able to speak uh, is is also kind of um, plot driven because you could very easily have him communicate via writing um, if he knew English, which he seems to, like he clearly knows English or, and and you know because he's uh, so he's not like speaking a different language as an inhuman, which is interesting to think about the inhumans that live on the moon and have been isolated from humanity, choosing English as their default language, whatever. Um, that, that that's already putting way more thought into uh, some of the series choices, I'm sure, than than some of the people on that worked on this product did. Anyway, um, uh, I have here many fans of the television show Agents of Shield uh, have asked whether or not any of the characters introduced in the Inhumans will cross over into other Marvel shows or movies. And in an interview published September 30th, 2017, so. Uh, a week into the run of the series. Marvel TV head at the time, Jeff Loeb, had told IGN, uh, do I look forward to the day where Daisy Johnson stands in front of Black Bolt and says, you aren't the king of me? Sure, we should be so lucky that both shows get to that day where we're going to see those characters interact. But there's no plan for that to happen right now other than the fact that we know they're in the same world and characters bump into each other. That's what happens. That's the Marvel Universe. So, again, I've not watched the rest of the series, but given how quickly this came and went, I'm guessing they didn't really have too much of that in the way of uh, uh, universe crossovers between um, kind of the Inhumans of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and the Inhumans of Inhumans. Um, but I will, I will probably be diving into the rest of the series, at least to, to kind of see it through. So I will see if, if they ever ended up kind of crossing over or not. The bigger question I have at this point is if these Inhumans will be made kind of canon or if they will kind of be rewritten somewhere down the line in the MCU, if they will get like a new, uh, a new incarnation of them and they'll just kind of write these, this show off as, yeah, it didn't really happen. Um, another little trivia thing that I enjoyed just because of who I am, uh, is that Cody Runnels, uh, AKA Cody Rhodes from, uh, formerly of WWE and currently the like president and CEO, I believe, of uh, All Elite Wrestling. Um, he wanted to play back Black Bolt. Um, probably stirred a little bit on from his uh, guest roles, uh, cameo roles, or you know, special appearance roles, or whatever in uh, in the Arrow series. Um, he played uh, a bad guy on there. I don't remember which one, but he was on there, kind of flexing his acting chops, and he's a you know, noted comic book and video game and, and all kinds of nerdy nerd. So cool to see that he was interested in playing Black Bolt. Um, would have been interesting to see what would have happened had he played the role instead. Uh, and then the last little bit of trivia I have here is the high cost of producing Lockjaw's VFX resulted in the character being removed from the series as it progressed. So I'm only... Like, I've, I've watched more or less the third episode, um, and by the end of the first episode, he's pretty much largely taken out of commission. Uh, you have Lockjaw kind of appearing a little bit here and there in episode two, and then, like, he has, I think, maybe a half a scene or something in episode three. So um, they really did not invest in how they were going to manage giant dog running around in this this real world um setting so uh this does not make any uh or this does not surprise me in the slightest that uh they had to kind of work around him throughout the series so now we dive into what did we think how does this hold up um and it's not as bad as i was expecting i came in kind of the general consensus is that this is the weakest mcu output the weakest thing in their offering um and going in with that in mind i was like okay how how bad can it really be and it it definitely makes some choices that i would not have made for the series at least again i, I can't speak to how the whole thing plays out but um but there are a couple choices in here that i think i'll dive into in a little bit that that i i think we can this they kind of it takes it takes the momentum out from the show right out the gate and uh and i think that you know hinders and hurts what they're having to deal with i think also though this is just trying to introduce this as a week-to-week -week offering because it was on abc and not like netflix meant that 
this was a series that, you know, these first couple episodes came out and kind of kicked the thing off. And then it was waiting a week every episode from there. And I don't know if it necessarily had like the if if they do a good enough job introducing these characters and this world to really get an audience to come back week two. If you don't already have like a pre existing notion of who these characters are and what this family is and who the inhumans are and what their, you know, struggle is, I think um uh, you're you're gonna be you're walking away from this a little bit confused. Like a, as it is, I, I don't know who all these characters are outside of um, you know, they, I think a lot of, I think these characters were pretty much featured in, um, Ultimate Alliance 3, the Black Order that I played last year. Um, but even there, like that was pretty much a chapter and then we're done and, and you're, they're in your roster if you want to use them. But, um, like as it is, I barely know what their powers are. If I know what their powers are, like some of them, I can't tell you like crystal i don't like she has a an energy beam from her finger and her dog can teleport but i don't know like more detail than that um so uh so having to introduce so many different characters right out the gate just kind of probably left an audience confused and i think um i i think it's it would be like if the Avengers movie, the first Avengers movie, just introduced all those characters in one go and said, OK, here we go. Now the movie is going um, trying to do the same here with um, with with this approach to the Inhumans, I think, um, is just probably too much information trying to be conveyed um, and not conveyed very well. Um so yeah, I think that's I think that's kind of how it it holds up. Um, like I said, I'll, I'm I'm planning on throwing on the the rest of the series and kind of like watching it. You know, probably not too focused on it or something, but I'll have it kind of play in the background while I'm playing through The Witcher or something like that to to kind of um, see how it plays out and how the story plays out and how these characters kind of come and go from uh, through this this struggle that they're in. But um, yeah, I'm I'm mostly curious to see how the Inhumans are treated moving forward in the Marvel Cinematic Universe as we're now heading into the the world where we're getting inter- Eternals movies and all that stuff. Um, will they revisit the Inhumans? Will it be a Disney Plus type show somewhere down the line, or um, or how will they really go about? Um, with any of that kind of stuff. So, or, or will they just kind of say, yep, nope, those were our hidden humans and probably not going to get them back in terms of like the cast. Cause they've probably gone on to other projects and stuff, but those were the inhumans. And now we're going to tell different stories now, especially now that they have Fox and they have the X-Men back in their corner. Maybe they don't even need to dive into the inhumans all that much. Um, Anyway, diving into some of my favorite moments uh, and scenes or my least favorite moments and scenes. Um, so I do want to tackle, I'll tackle the favorite moment things first. Um, one of my favorite elements is I really liked Karnak's ability or at least how it's like visually represented on screen. I don't quite, this is another case, I don't quite know if you if you told me like what are Karnak's abilities. I would say based on what we see, like he can like he has a pretty good like probability matrix and he can kind of envision strategically what will happen, um, kind of, uh, 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 how events will play out if he does certain things. Um, because what we see is he gets attacked and we see him kind of fight. The fight is another one of those things. It's like, Oh, the fight's a little weak. Um, uh, just in terms of like the hand to hand combat and how the action is shot and all that stuff is weird. But, um, the, the cool thing of the fight is that he, he goes through the fight, he takes out a couple of guards, but then he gets shot and, you know, dies. And we see like the camera basically pan up and we see him standing there and saying, well, that's not going to work. And so it's, it's kind of an interesting approach, um, to, to really explore and say, okay, he can see how that's going to play out. So he has to really, he has to think and rethink, okay, that doesn't work. So now I have to try this approach instead. I thought it was a really cool kind of um, way to visually represent that is seeing, you know, the bad way things play out. But then I feel like when I saw that down the line, um, like uh, there's a, a scene in the second episode where he's climbing um, and he's climbing down a, a you know cliffside or something like that, and he falls. Um, and so I immediately thought, 
that he was going to like that it was going to be another one of those moments that we were going to like see him back up on the on the side of the cliff saying okay don't step there but he didn't like he falls there and get and hits its head and then it seems to so far be kind of a a runner that his that ability is is not working um appropriately it's not working correctly so like he he sees how something should play out and then he goes and tries to do that thing and it doesn't play out that way and he's like uh bleh, what so um so that's one of the like the the things that i like and then i but i'm also curious about how they how they kind of use it moving forward uh, another element that i really enjoyed was Adelan's um, minimalistic design especially coming off of something like control uh last year uh, i loved the design of the oldest house uh in that game and kind of the the you know the the stark brutal minimalism all that kind of stuff Adelan feels very much in that same vein where it's just like giant walls of bare concrete um with you know a lot of angles playing around and all that kind of stuff so um just kind of like admittedly i like i'm sure uh, i'm sure part of that comes from the original designs uh, the original design concepts and stuff in the comics um and then i'm sure another element of it is like yeah let's let's do it like that because then we can just you know book out a warehouse or something like that and do all of our interior scenes in like one location really knock all that stuff out maybe you know move people around there you've got the same hallway serving as like four or five different hallways in the series i don't know um and then lastly i think i already touched on um kind of i really enjoyed black bolt sign language i liked what that kind of introduced uh as a as a um, kind of a, uh, a note to his character, even if I did think that it complicates things unnecessarily sometimes. Um, I also, one last one that I want to th- shout out here is um, I, I did enjoy, even though we don't see it too much, I really enjoyed Lockjaw's kind of the effect for Lockjaw's teleportation. Um, I enjoyed that it it looks more like like sand painting drifting away or something like that. Like the, the, the bodies of the people kind of dissolve into the teleportation instead of just like a blink and they're gone or something like that. I thought it was a, a cool visual way of representing that. That isn't just the, the normal things we usually see in terms of teleportation blink, a flash of light, whatever the case may be. Um, I thought it was a cool, cool approach. A um, couple things that I didn't like, um, the, the number one thing probably is that Maximus here just feels too much like a diet Loki type of character. Um, I would have liked a little bit, you know, broader flavor to, to him. And admittedly, some of that might change as the series progresses and and stuff. But in the first couple hours, he very much just feels like another, you know, spurned and overlooked brother who thinks he's entitled to more, um, and, and is overlooked because of his, you know, status as the second brother or the, it, you know, in Loki's case, it was he was the adoptive brother um, that he didn't know he was the adoptive brother. In this case, it's he's the brother that turns out to be a human after the uh, terragenesis kind of metamorphosis or whatever. Um, he, he kind of does not manifest any inhuman abilities and so he that like that leaves a chip on his shoulder and so i just felt like he was too much kind of retreading a lot of the same ground uh that we saw that we'd seen with loki back in the first thor movie um but we'll see how that how that continues to play out and then the i guess the, actually even this is the bigger thing really that i kind of touched on a little bit in terms of how this holds up i think um the decision to split up the the core family at the end of the first episode or by the end of the first episode hurts the show because instead of giving us like one story or a couple stories to follow, we're suddenly now having to track down six different stories basically because you've got um, Medusa doing her thing. You've got uh, Karnak doing his thing. You've got Gorgon with the, like the, the surfer guys Um, you've got, um, Maximus kind of doing his whole plotting. You've got Crystal kind of doing her thing. Uh, and then you've got Black Bolt just, you know, being captured and, and imprisoned and all that stuff. And then there's also like the the subplot that hasn't fully manifested yet in terms of the scientists that are like studying and, and looking into this. Um, the, the NASA lady. Uh, and then Henry Ian Cusack, who I remember from as Desmond from Lost. Um, he's not in the first two episodes, but he shows up here in episode three. Um, so I've seen a little bit of him kind of seeming to be another, you know, high powered science person that's interested in 
what's going on with the Inhumans and why there are you know new Inhumans appearing on Earth or something like that. Um, so, so really, the the idea of splitting up all of those characters just gives you too many different threads to have to follow, and um, I don't think any of them really get enough time to really get fleshed out in any given episode. So I would have much sooner see, you know, you could still, you know, have the family split up and then, you know, the season is about them finding their way back to each other, but split it up like two, two and two or something like that. Um, the, just the way, the way that everybody has their own arc, um, means that you're getting introduced to all these characters and you don't know who they are. And so you don't know why it matters that Karnak is, you know, captured, I guess, by, you know, um, people that are running a weed farm or something like that illegally. And, and yeah, so it just, it, I think it, I think that decision, that core decision for storytelling in, uh, in this season is probably one of the biggest things that really hinders, um, the, the progression of the series, but we'll see how it plays out as I continue on, uh, as I watch through the rest of, uh, the season. So overall, um, report card wise, I'm going to go ahead and give this just kind of a general C. Um, I don't think it's, you know, terrible. I don't think it's horribly egregious. Um, but I also don't think it's great. I don't think it does anything, um, especially grading on the curve of like the MCU where you have such great outstanding stuff. Um, this very much feels like a run of the mill kind of sci-fi show, um, that doesn't have the the Marvel charm that we're used to in a lot of these things. So, uh, so yeah, but it's, it's also just not like terrible. Oh, one of the other things I do want to shout out that I liked is I like that they, they set the thing in Hawaii. Um, I think that's a, that was an interesting choice, especially when they start tying it in to the narrative of, um, the, you know, the Hawaiian natives, um, kind of feeling like they, their fight, um, you know, mirrors Adelan's fight uh, or the, the royal family's fight against Maximus because um, they, you know, maybe hold resentment for originally having a king and being their own sovereign nation and then being just, you know, turned into a state because other people said you're a state now. Um, I like that that gets brought up and that idea is explored. And then just also Hawaii is a beautiful place and we don't see enough uh, enough stuff kind of shot there. Um, so yeah, that was really cool. Especially given that you have a couple people from lost, um, being in there. Uh, I thought it was a nice little tie back to that show as well. Uh, extra credit, uh, other shows that you might like, if you like this, um, the, the two obvious choices are going to be agents of shield and agent Carter. Um, and then none of them are on the, uh, the, the, Disney Plus side of things, but you have, of course, the Netflix shows as well. The your um, Daredevil and Jessica Jones and Luke Cage and Iron Fist and the Defenders and the Punisher. If you want to go that route, um, so yeah, basically, more Marvel TV is out there if you want it. Um, and I do have, I believe, one of the people that uh, has submitted that they want to be part of the show has submitted that they want to talk about Agent Carter. So we might have an, a dedicated episode on that series sometime in the uh, in the coming weeks as well extracurriculars what else are we watching on disney plus um at this point really i think uh i've i've hopped in here and there on a couple of the other things that people have suggested um but uh and that's what a lot of my you know upcoming disney plus watching is going to be is uh i've had a handful of people reach out and say oh i'd like to talk about this show or this or whatever um so i'll be do finding time to watch a lot of those things and then bring people on and discuss about them. Uh, and then outside of that, I think I've watched, uh, you know, a handful of Disney, uh, or, uh, Clone Wars episodes, a handful more of those, uh, in the lead up to, uh, the new season of Clone Wars here at the end of the month. So, um, stay tuned for that as well. Cause that's just, you know, fun stuff on Disney plus. Uh, so that's going to do it for this week's episode. And this, this kind of trial run of, you know, if push comes to shove, can this exist as a solo one person show? And, and I think, um, you know, I, th I, I, let me know what you think in the comments below. Um, I will say originally I, I, this is a second pass at this basically. Cause I recorded one and I was like, Oh, that only ended up being like 20 minutes. Um, so I threw in a few more trivia things. I threw in more of my reaction to those trivia moments. That was kind of the, um, the thing I learned from sitting down and trying to knock this out. Um, in a one shot, 
the first time around uh, and saying like, oh, it seems a little, little on the short side for one of these podcasts. But uh, we're sitting up here around 35 minutes now. So I think that I think that'll do nicely for uh, for a solo episode. Um, and then certainly, yeah, the of course, ideally, we want to have this be kind of, you know, back and forth, have other people on here that can kind of we can bounce ideas off of and and share, you know, other thoughts. But um, worst case scenario, if I have you know, everybody cancels on me or something like that. It's good to know that I can throw together one of these episodes for you guys. So we don't miss a week, um, in the, uh, in, in a pretty, in pretty short order. Um, so let me know what you thought about this format. Um, if I just should never even try it again, if you would much rather just say, screw it, don't do a show that week. If, if people cancel, let me know that too. Um, but that's going to do it for this week's episode. Thank you for joining me, uh, as I sat here and talked about the inhumans. Um, you can follow me at Trevor J. Starkey on Twitter. I will go ahead and shout out um, uh, yesterday is, uh, if you're listening to this the day it goes live, uh, we had our episode of That Nerdy Sight Show uh, that went live, and Christian and Frank sat down and talked uh, a lot about um, their love of the most recent Final F- uh, not Final Fantasy, uh, the, the recent Fast 9 trailer, uh, the Fast Saga trailer. Um, and kind of their reaction to that, as well as just kind of general Kingdom Hearts thoughts. Nice little two-person episode of the show with the two of them. Uh, And then uh, coming this Friday, uh, we start season two of that Ultimate Video Game List show. I've got a new panel of people um, on board for that. We've got uh, Scott White from Irrational Passions. We've got Brandon Gann, who is, um, you know, you, you probably heard hear questions from him in any number of podcasts that you might listen to um, because he listens to so many of them and submits questions and and gets read and all that kind of stuff. Um, We have uh, Zyger, uh, uh, Jonathan Zyger Landeros, uh, you know, prominent member of the Kind of Funny community, uh, and then recently announced that he's uh, contributing to My Xbox and Me with uh, MC Fixer. Um, so that was a cool little thing. Um, I, I got him signed on to the show like a day or two before that announcement went live. So I was like, oh, that's cool. Nice to see. Like, I was just thinking he would be kind of in, on the show as a community member. Anyway, so check that out. And then uh, rounding out the the panel, we have Aaron Muller of uh, Scoot, uh, Scoot Gang and the Scoot Cast, I believe. Um, uh, kind of another kind of funny community member. He's done a lot of stuff with Snowbike Mike as well. Um, so, uh, so yeah, check out the four of them, um, on that ultimate video game list show season two with me kind of serving as a, you know, moderator, but really letting them make the picks this time around. Um, they, uh, in our first, first round, they brought four completely new games to the, uh, to the table that we did not discuss in season one. So very cool there. I'm looking very forward to seeing where the rest of that season goes. Uh, you can follow everything that we're doing at that nerdy site um, or that nerdy site.com. Like I said, if you like what you heard, please rate, review, like, subscribe, all that fun stuff, share with your friends. Um, and if you do feel so inclined, you can always support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash that nerdy site. Um, if you want to be part of the show, if you have a, a Disney Plus offering that you would love to sit down and talk with me about, uh, you can go to that nerdy site.com slash D plus guest, um, either uh, just the plus sign or spell out plus and, uh, and fill out the form there. And uh, yeah, that's going to do it. Thank you for joining me. Uh, As always, stay nerdy, be good to each other, and class dismissed.